We praise you, O Lord, Son of God, Son of Man. You are Jesus, and you're right here holding our hands. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. I hear tell that there are one of two ways in which we can greet the day. The first is, oh, good morning, Lord. The second is, oh, good Lord, morning. <laughs> and it seems to me that Job had the latter going on. In our first reading today, he's not having a good day. He starts off by saying, what is man's life but a drudgery? Everything that we're doing is a toil, too much hard work. He's comparing it to like military life, saying that if we are looking for such joys from all this work, we ain't gonna get it. And he just goes on to that very familiar adage of a woe is me that we may have heard. I shall not see happiness again. <laughs> and the truth is, sisters and brothers, there are many times when we can relate to that, when it is hard to do the work that we're supposed to be doing. Now we hear in our second reading today Paul saying, that our recompense is by doing the gospel, not expecting any reward, not expecting life to be easier, but to do the work that God has for us to do. If we don't do that work, then things will be worse than we currently have them. So basically, suck it up and deal with it. But the truth is, sisters and brothers, there are times when it is hard to shine. We do have so many things that we have to face, challenges, difficulties, oppressions, subduings, disappointments, betrayals, and stresses, and anxieties that will leave us with a fever that would just put us down and keep us out. How do we go forward when that's the case? What do we do when it seems like the challenges that are coming for us are too overwhelming? What happens when we find ourselves sick and tired or sick and tired of being sick and tired? What do we do when it is easier to sit down and do nothing rather than shining bright as the lights we are? We heard many times how much that we are called lights of the world, salt of the earth, temples of the Holy Spirit and of the Lord, ambassadors of mercy, agents of love, the very people of grace, and God has indeed given us a work to do, outfitted us with a unique brick of gifts and talents, and told us to go, go, and to build the kingdom of God. It's a little prelude. <laughs> How do we do that when we're faced with such challenges these days? And I would love to be a, a word of encouragement to say that, oh, it's gonna get better, but I'm afraid it's gonna get worse before it gets better. We've got a lot to contend with. Situations in the home and amongst our relationships and what Pope Francis calls a throwaway culture. It is so easy to write people off simply because of one disagreement that really kind of gets under our skin. Family or friends people that we've been in relationship for a long time, rather than employing the works of reconciliation and mercy, we'd rather write them off, leave, unfriend them, 
ghost them. Ooh. <laughs> Our society, sisters and brothers who have felt that their voices have been silenced for too long, who really want to make room and make space for them to just be, are clamoring up for attention, for respect, for greater regard. It's in a cacophony of voices that are vying for attention, trying to figure out how we are going to come to terms with the true diversity that God has made and not settle for the things that make us comfortable. And in these growing pains of liberty, how do we manage our footing until we come to an understanding of how to do that well? We've got wars breaking out all over the place. And the wars are indeed going to get better before they get, well, they're going to get worse, sorry. They're going to get worse before they get better. I was hoping that was a Holy Spirit slip. <laughs> Something prophetic to share with you, but he just corrected me. <laughs> they're going to get worse before they get better. And we have to deal with the pandemic of anxiety, of fear, and of anger that has turned and toxified into rage and bitterness, incivilities that are becoming normalized, and we're supposed to shine amidst all this darkness. What happens when we find ourselves, like Simon's mother-in-law, afflicted with the fevers of apathy? or being overwhelmed, burdened, doubtful, and deafened to the voice of God's encouragement amidst all of the dramas that are raging. Well, the good thing is that the gospel has news for us, good news. And I think we might do well to take a page out of the playbook of Jesus who heals Simon's mother-in-law. Three things that we might want to enact and employ to help us continue forward in that call that Paul, if you will, encourages us to take. The first is this. Remember how Jesus learned about Simon's mother-in-law. James and John told him about her. I like to equate that to making sure that we have prayer partners. Somebody needs to be praying on our behalf. Raise your hand if you already have a prayer warrior praying you up. Okay, we only get success when everybody's hand is up. Amen? Oh, let me try that one more time. Places, everyone. Places. And action. We only get success when everybody's hand is up. Amen? Amen. And it is a simple, simple thing to do. It's just as simple as this. Watch this. Y'all ready? You ready? Here we go. Brother, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Okay, I'll take that. I'll take that. Handshake. Okay, will you pray for me too? You're hard-pressed to find somebody in the church that will say no to that request. Okay? So it really is about extending ourselves out to making sure that we are taking advantage of yet another treasure within community life. God has abundantly blessed us. Are we taking advantage of those blessings? Are we putting them to use? Or are we trying to go through this life based on our own understanding? Faith provides us with a great wealth. And here we have the faith of community, of people who pray, now just so we're sure, how many of us pray? Just pray, generally. Amen, amen. How many of us have room in our prayer lives for at least one other person? All right, so we got the folks here. We, can, we have the richness right here. Make sure that someone is praying for you. The more people that add to the prayer fund on your behalf, the clearer it becomes to the Lord that your life is meaningful to others. And we plead God to intervene, to take care of you, 
to lift you up, to help you understand who you are and whose you are, thank you, Thea Bowman, and to give you the restoration and the encouragement that you need to do the work that he has called you to do. Get your prayer partner. Amen? Amen. The second thing is this. When Jesus went to see Simon, Simon's mother-in-law, Scripture says he sat down next to her and held her hand, grasped her hand. This is something that happens all the time because of how Jesus loves us. He is trying to hold our hand right now. For anything that we're going through, the promise he made was to be with us to the very ends of the age. And not to do that from a distance, but to do that through an intimate love that is with us at every time and every measure. He wishes to hold our hands, to embrace us, to help us to know that we are not by ourselves. The question is, are we letting him hold our hands? because sometimes we can be a little too judgy about those sorts of things. Oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Just, just let, me, let me rest a little bit. I just need to rest. Th this will pass. Uh, just, just give me a little bit of water, a piece of cornbread. I'll be fine, okay? Just need to get my strength up. Oh, no, no, Lord. You don't want to hold my hand because of that thing that I did 150 years ago that I know you forgave, but I don't know if you really forgave. And because I'm sure you're still holding me hostage or on punishment for that, even though your mercy never fails, I'm going to pull my hand away. I don't deserve to have my hand held by you. Oh, merciful Lord. Do you see the schizophrenia that goes on there? Or, now is not the time, Lord, to hold my hand. I'll, I'll figure it out. Maybe we need to wait a bit more. Maybe there's a lesson here I need to learn. Maybe there's something else for me to do. As if we have more wisdom than the Lord who loves us and knows us better than we know ourselves. Jesus is trying to hold our hands. Let him do it. Amen? Amen? The third thing, it says that Jesus helped Simon's mother-in-law to get up and get on her feet. We can infer by that that she wanted to do it. She just didn't have the strength to do it on her own. This brings up a question for us. How healthy is our yes in these times of challenge? When we know that there are difficulties in front of us, how much are we still offering our yes to the Lord rather than lying there and giving up, rather than succumbing to the fevers of apathy? rather than giving more credibility to the doubts and to the forces of darkness than to the Lord and the riches of the light. How much are we just rather wanting to lie down than to get up with Jesus' help? And can we hear him say, Amidst all of that that is compelling us to stay in that bed, you can do this. There is nothing that we can't do. I can do all things but fail. I love you. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be open. Ask anything in my name and I will give it to you. All those empowering messages from a via positiva and then from the via negativa, don't be afraid, or rather, don't you let fear tell you who you are. Amen? Amen. 
Do not be anxious. Do not allow the vibrations of the drama to set the rules for you. Amen? Amen. Trust and believe in me. Do not ascribe loyalty to the things that destroy. Amen? Amen? Allow Jesus to help you up. Let him empower your yes so that you can do and be what you've been called to do and be. It comes down to a question that we really do have to answer very fundamentally. Are we going to live empowered by our blessings, and there are many, or encumbered by our burdens, for there are many of those too? Do we believe in the power that God gives to us through Christ to be victors on this road and not victims? The encounter of Christ is required for this, and he wishes to encounter us. The embrace of the Lord empowers us, and he wishes to embrace us. And in so many ways, we walked into this church, and the first person that we met Jesus was there in the midst. Y'all know the scripture, wherever there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. Amen? Amen. The second thing, when the scriptures were so beautifully proclaimed, go ahead, girl. When they were so beautifully proclaimed, Jesus was in the scriptures, informing and forming us in a word that brings life. Amen? When you beheld the beauty of your pastor, you beheld the beauty of Christ himself in persona Christi is resonant in the one who has been called to walk with you, to lead you on this journey of faithfulness. And most preeminently, we gather in this Eucharistic feast to take part of the body, the blood, the soul and divinity of him who wishes to feed us along the road. It ain't a reward for good behavior. That's like calling 911 after you put the fire out. It is food for the journey. The church is abundantly clear about that. But it's up to us to let that in. It's up to us to be revived by him who comes to hold our hand. And we need to do it. As I said in the beginning, we can't stick with business as usual, given the fact that there's so much before us where the people of God need to shine much more brightly, to take it up a step, take it up a notch, to be that in the world so that we can provide another way for those that are looking for hope so that we can show another way for those who are entrapped in situations of destruction, so that we can be the liberators and the voice of the gospel in action in our world this day. Let us be comforted and healed and revived by Christ. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen, church. Amen.